Hello and welcome everybody. I know we've got people filling in. The room is, is going to get pretty full. We've got a great turnout for everyone here tonight for this really, really important webinar and conversation. Uh, for those of you that I do not know, my name is Danielle Berman. I am the founder of Tackle What's Next, and we are so thrilled that you are here tonight for this conversation around the impact of concussions on athletes in life outside of sports and after sports. So I'm not going to do a lot of talking here. I want to get us right into our conversation, uh, but we are really excited that you're here. Uh, this is a Zoom webinar, so there's Q&A at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions, please do submit them through there. You can use the chat as well. We'd love to hear how you uh, are enjoying and feeling about this conversation. We've got a great lineup of panelists. So to kick us off and kind of turn over this conversation, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Robert Parisian, uh, who is gonna take it from here and introduce uh, our organizations that we're supporting as well as the panelists we're gonna have. So thank you so much, Dr. Parisian and uh, take it away. Thank you, Danielle, I appreciate that. And good evening to everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, as Danielle mentioned, uh, my name is Robert Parisian. I'll be the moderator for tonight's discussion on the topic of uh, the impact of concussions on athletes in their life after sport. Uh, a bit of my background, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, uh, sports medicine surgeon at Mount Sinai in New York City. Uh, I serve as a team physician for U.S. Ski and Snowboard as well as USA Fencing. Uh, and I also provide sports medicine coverage for the NYC Marathon. Uh, with regards to my athletic background briefly, um, I grew up playing uh, football basketball, baseball. I ran track, skied competitively. Uh, I and then ended up completing my undergraduate studies at Brown, where I was a member of the Brown Bears football team uh, and was very fortunate to win an Ivy League championship in 1999. I'm also proud um, to be a board member of both Athlete Soul uh, and Concussion Legacy Foundation, uh, two of the uh, supporting um, organizations uh, here tonight for tonight's discussion. Now, before we get started here, I, I first want to thank um, Danielle Berman and her team at Tackle What's Next for organizing and hosting this, uh, this event and this discussion. Uh, Tackle What's Next is a premier community and support team for athletes transitioning from sport by recreating a sense of team and camaraderie for athletes uh, to really find their purpose in life after the game. So thank you, Danielle, to you and your team. So the two supporting organizations um, for tonight's uh, discussion uh, Athlete Soul and Concussion Legacy Foundation. I just want to share a, a bit about them. Um, Athlete Soul is a nonprofit organization that was founded um, by Miriam Glez, uh, a two time uh, Olympic um, and uh, former CEO of USA Synchronized Swimming, who actually participated in four Olympic Games as an athlete, uh, a coach, and a team leader for four different countries. Um, so, yeah, she is very impressive and she's a force in the, uh, in the sports world. Uh, the mission of Athlete Soul is to support athletes as they transition away from sports. Athlete Soul raises awareness about the challenges of athletic retirement and encourages athletes to develop beyond sports through educational resources, group and individual transition and career coaching, as well as networking uh, to support athletes before, during, and after their retirement from sports. Uh, Concussion Legacy Foundation was founded in uh, 2007 by Dr. Chris Nowinski and Dr. Robert Cantu. Uh, the mission of Concussion Legacy Foundation is to support athletes, veterans, and all affected by concussion and chronic traumatic encephalopathy, also known as CTE. The Concussion Legacy Foundation works to achieve smarter sports and safer athletes through education and innovation and to end CTE through prevention and research. The Concussion Legacy Foundation provides personalized help to those struggling with the outcomes of brain research. Uh, ra rather, the outcomes of brain injury through the Concussion Legacy Foundation Helpline. Uh, the helpline offers guidance on how to choose the right doctor, connections to peer support, and information about concussion symptoms and treatment options. So this partnership uh, really uh, was born out uh, as my involvement with Concussion Legacy Foundation uh, as a member of the board, also with Athlete Soul as a member of the board. And it just seemed that both organizations um, had um, very synchronized uh, interests uh, in athlete uh, health and wellness and with, and with athlete soul um, into transition uh, to life after sport, uh, which is a, a major aspect. Uh, so we are joined uh, this evening by some very impressive, um, incredible panelists. I'd like to uh, give them an introduction uh, very briefly uh, into their backgrounds and then they can share a bit more of their, of their personal stories. Um, so uh, Kelly Conheny, is a former uh, pro soccer player uh, who now works as an account manager at Baller TV. Uh, she was a star soccer player at Virginia Tech from 2009 to 2013, where she set records for career points with 75, career game-winning goals with 14, and tallied the most assists in a single season uh, with 12, 
while becoming the only player in school history to record 20 goals and 20 assists in her career. Following her collegiate career, she played professionally with the USL uh, Women's League and the National Women's Soccer League, uh, finishing her career with the Houston Dash. Kelly is a member of Athletes Soul. Quentin Q. Williams. Uh, so Q is a men's coach um, for current and retired athletes and is a leading authority on male athlete wellness um, and is the founder of the World Class Method, uh, which he will tell us more about shortly. Q is also uh, the lead facilitator of the Beyond Sports program through Athlete Soul, designed to help athletes uh, learn about themselves beyond sport. So with Q's athletic background, Q is a two-sport athlete at Northwestern and a member of the Gator Bowl Championship team of 2013. He holds a master's degree in sports management and serves as an official provider for the Pro Football Hall of Fame Health, uh, creating solutions for former NFL players who have struggled with, your, with the transition uh, from the game. Q is a member of both uh, Athlete Soul and uh, Concussion Legacy Foundation. Dr. Kira Dockery uh, is a New York State licensed clinical psychologist and the director of the NFL Lifeline, uh, a free and confidential 24-7 emotional wellness and suicide prevention hotline available to the entire NFL community administered by Vibrant Emotional Health. Dr. Dockery also oversees Vibrant Health's partnership with the NBA in the development and administration of their mind health uh, training initiatives. In her previous roles uh, at the New York State Office of Mental Health, she served uh, as the statewide coordinator on Project Liberty, which is a $132 million FEMA-funded mental health outreach response to the events of 9-11. She also served as the first network development coordinator during the development and implementation of the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Dr. Dockery also serves on the NFL's Mental Health Advisory Board, the Family Advisory Board of the Harvard Football Players Health Study, the Concussion Legacy Foundation's New York City Advisory Board, and the advisory board for the CDC funded Mount Sinai Injury Control Research Center. As an athlete, Dr. Dockery is a former member of the squash team at Harvard University and was nationally ranked as the third best squash player in the country. I'm glad to have you all here. DJ Woodward uh, is a mother of four from Louisville, Kentucky and earned a graduate degree in nursing from the University of Virginia. DJ's daughter, May, experienced five concussions and was recently diagnosed with post-concussion syndrome and postural orthostatic tachycardia, also known as POTS. May was forced to retire from field hockey because of her injuries and is still in recovery. DJ is joining to share her experience as a caregiver for a child with concussion and to offer observations about what the experience of retiring from sports has been like uh, for May, uh, herself, and her family. So thank you to all the panelists for joining us. Uh, I think we should get started uh, and start hearing your stories. Um, and if Kelly, if you wouldn't mind uh, kicking us off. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Parisian. Um, it's an honor to be a part of this panel. Um, I really look up to the Concussion Legacy Foundation for all the work that you guys do. Um, my first concussion, like you said, was in 2009. Um, excuse me, sorry, I started playing soccer in uh, 2009 in college, and my first concussion was in 2012. Um, I guess, Dr. Parisian, you kind of gave the whole background, right, of, of my college experience. So I'll go from there and just say uh, the concussion that really ended my career. Um, I walked off the field in my sixth game. I didn't think it would be a career ending injury. Um, and I went up to my trainer and I said, I, I, I have a headache. I, I'm nauseous. Um, I need to go see a doctor like this is not okay. Um, leading up to that point, I was going nonstop from my junior year, kind of with the mindset of I need to make the national team. Um, I can't stop playing soccer. This is the only option for me is to keep going. I was never really given an option to take a break. So um, the USL championship preceded my senior year preseason. We went from spring of my junior year, um, drove all the way up to Canada, took four days to drive there, played every single day up to preseason of my senior year, six games in, that's when my concussion happened. Um, and, you know, I had all the typical symptoms of concussion. It was really just off of a diving header. It was a really easy diving header that I usually take and get up and feel fine after that. Um, but this one, you know, I, I came off the field and talked to my trainer. She brought me, she brought me in, took a look at me and she said, we can't put you back on the field until your headaches go away. Um, and my headaches did not go away that year. I tried to come back and play a fifth year and my headaches 
did not subside. Um, every time I got on the field and, you know, did a, did a, did a fitness test, they would come back. And as the days and the really months went on, I was just kind of like losing more hope. So I never wore a Virginia Tech jersey again. Um, I thought soccer was done for me after college and it was a really hard pill to swallow. Um, I dealt with a lot of mental symptoms like anxiety and depression that I had never dealt with before. Um, but you know, I didn't really feel like I had a choice. I had to hang up the boots and, and call it quits. Um, I worked for a nonprofit overseas called coaches across continents. I was living out of a backpack for a year using soccer as kind of a social tool to educate in third world communities. Um, and really took that time to just rest, completely rest my head, you know, was kind of feeling better than it ever has. Um, and then I went to see a doctor. So a year after, um, I came back from, I was in Uganda year back when I came back from Uganda, saw a doctor at uh, Pittsburgh medical center. And they said, there's a treatment for concussions, which I never knew anything about. Um, so I took a four step approach. Um, I did vestibular therapy for, you know, like just spatial awareness. Um, I did ocular therapy. My eyes weren't working together at the time. So I got a pair of glasses and did a lot of eye training that helped me um, help my eyes work together. I did exertional therapy. So anytime I got on the treadmill and I reached a certain point where I would get a headache, I took a break and then it was kind of like two steps forward, one step back, this awesome program that they put together for me at Pittsburgh medical center that essentially got me back on the fields, able to train. So three and a half years after I stepped off the field at Virginia tech, um, I walked into an open tryout with sky blue. They're in the national women's soccer league. It's the pool of players that is the pool for the national team players. Um, and I made it onto sky blue in my open tryout. Um, and that was kind of the beginning, beginning of my professional career. Um, I would say, you know, my professional career was three years long. I played in New Jersey. I played over in Houston and then I ended my career over in Sweden. Um, you know, and I really, I really kind of had symptoms all throughout, um, and was never able to really feel like I fully got back and was myself. And it was kind of at that point where I realized like, okay, this is, this is it. Now I'm like hanging up the boots for good. I'm done. Um, I don't know, you know, I, I haven't gotten the answers, right. This is back in 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15, and then ended my career in 2018. So didn't have the answers then still don't have some of the answers now of, you know, really kind of what happened, how that, how it all, you know, accumulated to get me to that point where, um, where I, I couldn't play, I had headaches every day, I had all the symptoms. Um, but, but that was the end of my career. Uh, so I moved out to California and kind of just started my life over and, um, took a new step in a new direction and, and, and said goodbye to soccer for a while. Um, so here I am today, I'm in New Jersey, um, moved home from California. I really feel better than I ever have. Like my, my head feels amazing. I never really thought there would be another side of this. And I never thought that I would not feel symptoms. There was a point in time where I was at a very low point where I, where I was like, this is how I'm going to feel for the rest of my life. And I just have to deal with it because I was three years symptomatic, it's terribly symptomatic. Um, but you know, this is like, what I say to everybody is everybody has their own story with concussions, but also like there is another side of it. And there, there is, you do heal eventually if you take the right steps and, um, and you have a great support system. So that's kind of the gist of my story. I mean, um, I know there's probably some more to it and, um, could get into it more, more in depth, but, um, yeah, I'll, I'll stick with that for now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing. I mean, every time I listen to you talk about uh, your story and, and uh, your past with this, it's, uh, it's it just goes to show how personal um, this is and, and truly how much of a journey it was for you, um, yeah. you know, and uh, I think uh, we're all looking forward to sort of coming back to that during this discussion and, and getting a little bit deeper into it. Um, yeah. But uh, Q, why don't you go ahead and uh, kind of give us your, your background here and uh, let us know why you kind of came involved with Athlete Soul and Concussion Legacy Foundation, the incredible work you're doing uh, uh, with your method as well. Yeah, thank you, doctor. Um, it's great to be here. This feels like a wonderful marriage of some amazing organizations and, and Dr. Robert as well joining us and leading this because um, back in 2012, I learned about the concussion problem through Chris Nowinski and the Concussion Legacy Foundation, all the books and documentaries that were going on at that time. 
but it was still very early on in like the concussion information age. And um, I realized I wanted to support um, and find, be part of the solution. It took me many years because I was actually going through my own post-concussion syndrome journey. So I finished up my college career in 2012, um, had a concussion my senior year, but never got it diagnosed. But I remember the play. I was seeing double for about five minutes, never got it checked out. It went away. And I wish I would have taken myself out of that game, but we were winning in the big house at Michigan. It was the first time we were going to beat them and we ended up losing. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, one of the topics I talk about so much these days, um, you know, coming full circle is I really think athletes really struggle with, you know, knowing when to put themselves first and when to put the team first and how to balance that. We're seeing that constantly with athletes, life after sports. Um, but my, my journey um, is, is similar to a lot of the folks on here. I had post-concussion syndrome. I had a lot of confusion trying to figure out whether my mental issues and like my, my depressive thoughts and my, um, my sadness, my moodiness, my headaches when I'd walk in the grocery stores, all these different things were so confusing to me. And it was a state of mind that I had never been used to. I was, as an athlete, you're used to being on the top of the world and being one of the best performers and the leader. And I didn't feel like the leader anymore. And um, it, wasn't, it wasn't until a few years later that I started realizing there are probably some things that I can do outside of just you know the, the biological part of my brain and taking care of it and doing vestibular training and doing ocular training. What can I do that's gonna like light me up and make me feel back on fire again. And I started surrounding myself around other guys like myself um, that were in similar situations. I, I created community because um, I had been isolating myself, trying to fight this on my own. So I surrounded myself in community. I surrounded myself around um, mindset tools and um, ways to think about life and ways to think about you know, owning my purpose, which you know, my purpose, like I said, back in 2012 was being a part of the solution. And I was dragging my feet on that. But the really cool thing was once I really started taking ownership of that and really shifted my, my frame of reference, um, things got a lot better. I, my symptoms almost went away. I still do struggle with post-concussion syndrome a little bit. Um, but you know, as many football players probably on here, maybe Dr. Parisian can relate, um, you kind of always live with a bit of a headache you know, as a football player because you use your head so much and you're kind of used to you know, going through practice with a headache. And so some of these symptoms can be confusing after sports, knowing whether it's just everyday life for a former football player or a, a regular person, or um, it's something worse, right? Um, and so my, my methodology, what I, what I do today is for the last few years, I've, I've been working with different organizations like CLF, Talk What's Next, Athlete Soul to provide programming for current and former athletes to really own their purpose. And I, I use something called the world-class method, which you know, is, is a bit of a hodgepodge of everything that I talked about, you know, the, the community, the sense of identity, uh, the sense of purpose beyond sport and all those different facets. So uh, that's a bit about me and I'm really happy to be here. Thanks, Q. I mean, such a great, uh, unique perspective that you have and uh, incredible uh, way in which you figured out how to work in hodgepodge to a uh, concussion conversation here. So that's great. But um, no, thanks for sharing, Q. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Dockery, um, you have a, a unique perspective uh, as both an athlete here and then as someone who provides uh, a lot of support um, for athletes um, and families um, that are sort of going through this currently, that are transitioning away from it, out of you know, many questions and concerns. So uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, sort of sharing a little bit of your, of your story. Sure, sure. Um... I love hearing all these stories, but yes, I will briefly <laughs> give you a little bit of how I ended up um, involved in CLF and in this space at all. As you know, Dr. Parisian mentioned, I played a sport which was pretty safe for your head. <laughs> Squash is a racket sport, and yeah, I never had a concussion. And really, I went into you know mental health as from my bio, really kind of after 9/11, and and then kind of went into the suicide prevention space. And that's where I was sort of working when in 2012, when the NFL had a really tough year for suicide and former players. There were quite a few players, um, maybe the most well known at the time being Junior Seau, who all died by suicide, left notes regarding their brain health and donated their brains. Um, and 
at that point, I got sort of my two worlds collided in some ways because my dad also played in the NFL. So I had that sort of piece of this and actually had quite a few concussions himself um, during his playing days. But I, you know, came back to an organization that was running the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline that I had uh, worked for previously. And we started a suicide prevention program and really outreach program for uh, primarily former players transitioning out of the league. Um, and it has been, and I think we're going to touch on a lot of the topics about why that's a really vulnerable time, certainly not just for NFL players, for athletes in general. Q was talking a little bit about this, but, um, you know, we were trying to outreach to uh, men who, A, were not used to asking for help, certainly not around mental health issues, uh, let alone potentially con- concussion related issues. That's another thing we teach athletes to sort of play through pain, right? But of course, as a psychologist and a a suicide prevention specialist, you know, chronic pain is a big risk factor for depression, for suicide, for hopelessness. So whether we're actually talking about the brain injury itself, or we're talking about managing pain, that's then we're not even getting into what it means to kind of lose the sport. So, you know, there was a lot of issues. There's, um, you know, I think we're going to spend some time later talking about identity and you mentioned that too, but that's a big piece of this. And I can certainly, as like a clinical psychologist, talk about how important identity development is in adolescence, right? And all of you here who were like fantastic athletes, um, you know, are identified early, young, right, as being such. And so, so much of your identity development and who you are and the sense of who you are comes from that period of really like your huge athletic successes. So being an athlete becomes a huge, just central to your identity. And that's something we kind of need to look at because then boom, like one injury and it's gone, uh, can have a huge ripple effect, uh, for mental health. And, uh, so there's a lot of, you know, I think the things we're going to talk about, but for, so for the last eight years, I have been running, Um, the NFL lifeline and working with current and former players and their family members, caregivers of folks um, who struggle with various levels of, you know, mental health and head injury issues. So I'm happy to talk about all of those things here. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, And, you know, as you said, I mean, we're we're certainly going to dive deep into those topics because it it, it gets brought up all the time with regards to athletes and, and transitioning to that aspect where you're an athletic person, maybe not an athlete in that sense anymore, and the identity and community and purpose and, and how do you reconcile these things. And now for this conversation uh, with regards to uh, concussions and how that might be impacting that entire process for you. But uh, sort of before we dive uh, into that, um, maybe the most valuable panelist here uh, would be DJ uh, Woodward. Uh, we're so uh, you know uh, glad and, and lucky to have you join us tonight. Um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, please uh, sharing your uh, your story um, of your family. Sure. <clears throat> thank you so much for having me, and thank you, Quentin and Kelly, for sharing. It's it's really nice to hear um, somebody's perspective who's now on the other side and found their identity in their life outside of uh, their sport. <clears throat> My daughter May um, is only fifteen, and she got her first concussion in field hockey in fifth grade. We were in Florida and she blacked out and they took her to the sidelines and they said she was fine and she'd be fine to play. And luckily there was a coach there who came over to me who had had some experience. And she said, whatever you do, do not let her play the rest of this tournament. She said, I saw that. And I was watching my other daughter on another field. And she said, when you go home, you need to immediately go see a neurologist. And I'm so grateful for that. So um, he, she stayed with him throughout her later concussions. Her third one was last spring, a freak accident during PE. And she recovered fairly quickly. And then she got another one um, this fall playing field hockey. And she was told that she was out for six months, which was, hard at the time for her to take. She had made varsity as a freshman and um, on a competitive team. And she was already sort of being scouted by NCAA coaches and, you know, going to all the club stuff and had, you know, her identity and her vision was seeing herself as a college athlete. 
So missing that whole freshman year, she had already, we were already working on our recruiting video and she was emailing coaches and, um, but that whole time she was already dealing now what I know she was just keeping it inside, but dealing with the what ifs, if I get another one, what am I going to do? Well, sure enough, she gets another one in January playing tack or not tackle touch football with her brothers. And it was a freak accident. And after that, um, she wanted to immediately go to the neurologist because she knew what he was going to say. And he said, you know, it's really not smart for you to play anymore. So, you know, hindsight now, I'm so grateful that we did have him. I'm grateful that we went to him initially. Um, had we just gone to a pediatrician or, you know, some other family doctor, maybe they wouldn't have told us that. And so hopefully she will not end up having any terrible CTE or anything. Um, so how I got connected with um, Concussion, Concussion Legacy Foundation is she um, just really got in a dark place. I mean, she's always been sort of, as Kelly mentioned, the leader of the pack and just raw, raw and you know, kind of just a light in our home always. And she was not that, and we were very concerned. Um, and then there were some things that alert, her coaches alerted us to some things that were very alarming. So in a latch just ditch effort, I just started Googling <clears throat> and um, found Concussion Legacy Foundation and typed in on the helpline and thinking, I've never done that in my life, but I thought nobody's going to reply to me. And um, sure enough, like two days later, I get a call from Chris and he leaves a voicemail and says, please call me. And so I'm sure we'll get into more details, but that's how I was connected. And I'm still in contact with him. He's helped us the last six months through a lot of things. So thanks for having me here. Well, DJ, thanks for being here and thanks for sharing uh, your story because, uh, you know, with you, obviously, it's so personal and it gives us uh, such a, you know, a uh, different perspective um, as well um, as, uh, you know, families going, you know, through this process and uh, trying to care for your, uh, you know, your daughter in your case, but, you know, your daughter or sons that are going through things. Um, I want to circle back as to what we said and, uh, and get started uh, in on discussing uh, what we'd said before with regards to identity, you know, as athletes, you know, you are an athlete. And whether it's you're a soccer player, you're a squash player, you're a football player, whatever it may be. And that's probably how you describe yourself um, to your friends. And, and that's how you're known, right? To your peers, to your hometown. Um, and then certainly if you're playing at the, at the greater levels. Uh, and you have that sense of community, right? You have that community, that culture that you know, that you're comfortable with, that, um, that, that you've grown up with um, from youth athletics. Then you get into this phase of, you know, Q, you talked about it, you, you know, you get your, you get your bell rung, you know, is what we used to say, right? And, 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 and many athletes still probably say that. And what they don't know is a bell rung is probably a concussion. Um, and then the second bell rung is another one. Um, and so, uh, you know, how during your transition, I guess Q and go to you first and then, and then Kelly, um, you know, how was that uh, with regards to, you know, your, your process and your transition in, in, into life after being an athlete, so your post-athletic life, um, dealing with those things? Gosh, that, that's the whole rabbit hole of like sorting out my identity after sports. But what, what first thing I'll say, Robert, I'm glad you asked this question is uh, really, you know, sometimes we think of identity as being like an internal thing, right? But it's such a interpersonal and social thing. It's how other people perceive us. And so a lot of athletes um, have to reorient how they show up in the world. I see this constantly. And so it's not just a, you know, reconciling myself with myself and living that out. That's one thing, because knowing who you are is really important and being true to that is just as hard. Um, but being true to that in the face of people that know you as an athlete or come to expect you to operate in certain ways, um, that can be tricky. And um, it, it definitely has been for me, you know, my evolution um, as a man and, you know, taking on a new identity and starting a business and doing things outside of sports has not been easy. Um, it's I've I've come up against, you know, um, social pressures, right? Um, like 
being an entrepreneur and talking about this topic is not something that, you know, a lot of athletes talk about or a lot of my teammates want to talk about. And so um, that's been a little bit lonely in its own, right? Um, and so like, you know, formulating my own identity after sports, it is really tricky. I talk to so many athletes that go through this, um, whether they're clients of mine or former teammates of mine that are trying to find that tribe um, and trying to find community. I think it really starts with knowing who you are, but it's such a double-edged sword because we, we only know who we are when we're in community, when we have feedback, when we have mirrors. So, you know, isolation is not necessarily the answer. Um, it's really going out there and trying things and, and, you know, throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks, right? and trying on new ways of being. That's what I say. Um, so I always tell my clients, you, you got to go out in the world and try things. Otherwise, you're, you're just going to be reading a book and there's no Play-Doh to work with. You got to have something out in, in public to kind of mess around with to formulate your identity. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too, you mentioned community, right? Because that is a, that is a huge aspect of it. And we're, we're always seeking that community and you're, and you're comfortable with that community of particular athletes that you're with. Um, and, uh, and you can have it and you, and you said it there before the isolation, the isolation, and it's a very emotional, you know, aspect of, of this transition. I mean, look, I did, I, I published on a study looking at the mental health and emotional aspects of athletes during the COVID-19 pandemic and athletes struggled when they lost that community. What helped things like having access to facilities and gyms, having regular zoom meetings, virtual meetings with, with your coaches, with your teammates, a sense of community. That was one of the biggest things that helped them from a mental health standpoint uh, was simply that. Now, of course, they miss playing their sports, but really being engaged and staying with that community. Now, Kelly, we've talked before and, 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 and you've definitely mentioned um, about some of this, this isolation that, that is felt um, during that process. And I think you have a very unique scenario where you, know, you had sustained some head trauma during your, during your time. You sort of thought you were retiring um, through athletics or being forced into retirement from your concussions. And then you kind of came back from that. Um, and you were able to play again after that. But I mean, I can imagine how, how trying and emotional that was of the time and how, and, and, you know, please uh, let us know how, you know, you could sort of dealt with that and, and maybe some of the social supports and, 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 and such that you had along that path. Yeah. I mean, this topic, honestly, I'm 10 years, you know, out of college, I'm 31, and I, I still, there's like still that athlete in me that always wants to go back and play and feels like I can do it. Um, I've talked to a, my, my good friends about this. And like you said, Q, it's like, it's always in the back of your mind. Like maybe I can make another comeback. Um, I think I've gotten to the point now and why I left this sport in the end was, you know, I, I was like, there's just not enough purpose in this for me anymore. Like, I just didn't feel that, that passion and drive that I used to feel. I was like, there's something bigger for me out there. Um, and I still think that there is something bigger. I think I took a little step away from the game after I was done. Cause I was, I was honestly spent and it was almost like I had to unlearn these like athlete behaviors that made me the good athlete, like the professional athlete that I was. Um, and I, I talk a lot about that, um, with, with people that go through it as well, because, you know, the, the behaviors and, um, the qualities that made me the best player, one of the best players at my sport was also a quality that I don't know if it does you very good in life in every situation. Right. So I've, I've been unlearning. And like you said, too, I can really relate to like, who am I? Like, that's the big question. Like, who am I like without a ball at my feet? Like who is Kelly Conheny? And that's the question that I have really been like, I've been like putting my, my heart into, like I put into soccer. And I think that's the key there is like trying to find out who you are without your sport. Um, and for me, that's been a lot of also, with the concussion came a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety, a lot of mental health that I've never faced before. It's not talked about um, as much as it needs to be. I think it's like, okay, you're done being an athlete. Now go move on, like figure it out. And that's where you really need the help and the transitional like support and guidance. I'm really lucky to have an amazing family that's like been there for me through everything, but was really hard to, to open up to them even about how, how I was feeling because they're, they're people that support me at my sport, but also want to see me do well. So, you know, it was just kind of this tough thing. I didn't really know how to explain my feelings. I didn't know how to really get into detail about what I was feeling. I'm just like, I don't feel good. I, 
my symptoms led to anxiety. Um, I couldn't look people in the eye because my eyes weren't working together. That led to more anxiety. Um, the chemical imbalances in my brain, like I felt like friends were leaving me because I just didn't, I couldn't be there like I, I used to be. I couldn't be the athlete I used to be. Um, and, and it's just like layer upon layer. But when it comes down to it, when you leave the sport, it's like this sport is a sport, but it's not the rest of your life. And you are an amazing person. That's what people love you for. They don't love you because you play a sport. It might feel like that your whole life. But yeah, I really just go back to kind of um, my identity, like post sport on learning that behavior of what made me the athlete that I was. And I'm kind of rebuilding that keeping parts of what I was, but, um, totally kind of clean slate. If I want to pick it up again and add that to, you know, the toolbox, I, I can, but if I want to leave it behind, like that's, that's my old kind of life. And I have just kind of had tunnel vision of moving forward and trying to be more present and, um, and, and move forward with, kind of, you know, this like healthier mindset of, um, of who I am. Yeah. I mean, obviously that seems to be a common thread as, as, as we just discussed, you know, it's sort of that isolating feeling that you're having. And then you had it, you know, with regards to your, you know, the head trauma that you were experiencing, uh, and then also trying to do this transition. And then I think it, it really speaks to another thing that continues to come up, um, that I know you both have a lot to share, uh, and, uh, Dr. Docker initially, um, uh, sort of alluded to is the stigma, right? The stigma of, this, uh, you admitting, you know, Q as someone who's a Gator, Gator Bowl champion, you know, who's playing in the big house in University of Michigan, you know, how do you go about and, and start discussing, you know, hey, my head doesn't quite, you know, feel right, or, you know, I'm feeling a little, uh, you know, a little isolated, a little lonely, um, that, you know, and Kelly, that, that you touch upon too, um, you know, for a very, very long time, you know, that was a huge stigma, and I think it's a stigma in a lot of other aspects, but certainly in athletics. Um, and so, uh, Dr. Docker, since you, you, you sort of touched upon that earlier, um, you know, what are, you know, sort of the, the ways in which you're seeing athletes, you know, come to you or, or struggle dealing with this and, and, and what sort of supports have you been able to sort of provide them? And obviously Q and, uh, and Kelly, if you, you could jump in as well and sort of just describe your own, you know, experiences there. Sure. Um, there's, there's so many things to touch on what both Q and Kelly were talking about, but specifically regarding stigma, I mean, you know, I love when you said, Kelly, like there are a lot of things that served you really well on the field that didn't necessarily off the field. Right. And there's a lot of factors there. I think, you know, athletes are, you know, taught to push, like I said before, push through pain, push yourself to the limit. Um, you're taught to really in, in, keep things internal, like any weakness, right. Is seen, you know, any as like could be taken advantage of, you know, and so you're supposed to keep that inside. Um, and, and not talk about these things. And then, you know, a lot of elite athletes, a lot of athletes in general are really quite sort of perfectionistic in a lot of ways, which can be helpful in practice, but is also not so helpful in life at times. It can really lead to, um, it is, you know, it is, can lead to depression really in terms of never kind of feeling okay um, with where you are and that yardstick always moving and you never kind of feeling like you're, you're good. Um, but you know, because of all of those things, there's a huge amount of pressure for athletes to present well, right? Especially Q, you alluded to this sort of community, right? That looks up to you when you're an athlete. Um, and so for them too, there's pressure coming from them to sort of present well all the time. And that's a really isolating experience. Um, so you have all of these factors um, sort of converging to create a situation of real isolation. So, you know, we know with stigma, say, whether it's about mental health, whether it's about talking about concussion, um, but we know the way we like change stigma in a culture is to get people talking about their experience openly. And, and you know, at Q, you talk about how hard that's been, like, thank you. Thank you for like other men who, where there's huge amount of pressure to not talk about these things. Kelly, thank you for, for sharing your journey, particularly Kelly, like the part of your journey where you talk about how you didn't even realize there could be life beyond, that you could recover, that you could have a life without that pain, right? Because, you know, if there's anybody listening here who is struggling with these, these types of issues, it's so important to hear the full journey, not just the like struggle. Oh, I can identify with that. Or I feel, I also feel really alone, but how you got out of that, 
and that you can get out of that and that athletes do come through this transition and they do even if they have a, a you know a, an injury that ends their sport entirely that they can create a life beyond that and an identity beyond that and if there's parents listening this is the last thing i'll say on this topic like if there's parents listening you know, start these conversations much much earlier you know that's i think our problem um and start them with boys you know i think we, we tend to talk with girls a little bit more about whether it be mental health issues but you, we got to be talking this across the board talking about these things earlier and then also talking to your kid about all the parts of themselves earlier you know, so helping them value different aspects of themselves beyond what's serving them really well on the field. Maybe that's, you know, kindness. Maybe that's, you know, they're great at math or who knows what it will be, but start pointing out and, and they're getting a ton of praise for like an amazing athlete, but, but make sure they see their feel full sort of humanity and who they are entirely so that it just doesn't become so narrowed um, cause that will happen over time and that can help a little bit with that identity, uh, piece, but events like this, thank you to all of our hosts. Like this really helps with stigma. Like let's be talking about this a lot. Yeah. I hope you don't mind. I, I'd love to add on to that. I, I love what you said, doctor. Um, because so when it comes to the stigma, um, Yes, you're right. Like events like this, talking about this, having, you know, open conversations and dialogue um, about our experience, I think especially as men, that's why I focus on men, because men are the, the least likely to actually seek out the support. And sometimes they just need a tap on the shoulder and invite um, in order to even say maybe. And so um, one of the things that I do, I lead um, a lot of men's containers. Like what, what I mean by containers is like a, a confidential um, space, whether virtually or in person, that was the number one thing that really helped kickstart me about five years ago was sitting in a men's group um, around other guys, kind of like a, a locker room, but not actually like no sports, no beer, you know, it was just like life. And it wasn't just concussions, it was just life, you know? Um, and that really fueled my evolution and my, you know, my coming of age really, like my, my me stepping into my manhood. And I would think, I say like, um, one of the things we focus on primarily um, in those groups is actually emotional awareness. And, you know, especially going through post concussion syndrome um, and being, you know, a potential CTE candidate, like emotionality, moodiness is so common. Um, depression, anxiety, all these things are so common. And I've found that a lot of athletes have used sport for so long. Like for me, it was since the age seven use that as an outlet for anger and rage and sadness you know we we take it out on the field as energy and it can be productive it works you know but when we lose that outlet um often i find that a lot of athletes are left with you know a pit in their stomach and they don't know what to do with those emotions and they pop up and they they go out on the wrong people or in the wrong situations and one of the biggest things i think athletes can do post sport is learn practical ways to channel your emotion first off like anger usually is just like a surface emotion there's most likely something much deeper than that uh, for me it was sadness my mother passed away when i was younger and my whole high school career was lights out because i was angry i was playing angry but i was really sad when i really look back at that and so um i think you know those two things really um opening up about your emotions and finding a confidential space and people that you trust that can hold the safety really, you know, that in most locker rooms, you don't have safety to talk about these things. You have to create that or go out, go and find that, I think. So some important things that you touched upon there, Q, you know, you went out and you created that community. You created a new community for yourself and for others. Uh, and to your point, as you said, an environment where you sort of knock down all the stigmas, you know, and, uh, and I think that's, that's wonderful. But and you, you had done it later on, and I think it, it, to your point, it's it's so important to not just these, you know, our background with football, for example, all locker rooms, right? Knocking down that stigma within every locker room that exists today when kids are in their teens, not learning that when they become, you know, in their mid twenties, late twenties, thirties, uh, and now coming to these revelations. Um, 
Kelly, I want to go to you real quick about um, about this and, and see what you have to add, because I know you have uh, much to add um, to this uh, uh, discussion. And you also talk about resilience as well and how that, you know, uh, you had to touch upon a bit, how that, while that helped, helped you as an athlete, may have been a little bit detrimental to you uh, in your life, you know, sort of uh, post your athletic uh, career. And I'd love to come back and, and, and discuss with that with DJ as you're hearing about all of these, uh, these stories here, you know, how, how you're sort of experiencing things with May um, and what has sort of helped you along the, along the way and some advice that you might have for other families. Yeah, no, I think this is a huge topic. I think, you know, um, for men, you know, I can't relate there, but for women, I think, you know, growing up, I kind of wanted to like play like a man. Like I was like, I wanted to be a boy because I saw them and they were tough and they, and I think a lot of the girls around me and on my teams were kind of had the same mindset of we're, we're tough and we're, we're tougher than guys. If you watch a soccer game, right? It's like, oh, girls aren't like, you know, falling down and grabbing their knee, but we kind of own that. Like that was like our pride. So, you know, it's, it's like getting up after a big hit, everybody claps. Right. And, um, and that's what I, I mean, that's kind of the team player that I was like, I'd put my head anywhere. Like if you ask my teammates, the type of player that I was, and that's where, you know, that was my downfall. And that's kind of what I talk about with resiliency. It's something I definitely learned with concussions. It, it took, it took me to get to that point, to have a brain injury, to, to you know, to get hurt, to realize um, that it could only get me so far. And, you know, I hid my emotions my whole life and kind of like you said, Quinn, Q, um, I, you know, I put all my anger and all my energy into my sport. Um, and that's like how I dealt with all my emotions. And I never, you know, I was just wasn't good at speaking my emotions. So when it came time, you know, to talk about what was going on, I didn't really have the words and I just thought it was easier to suck it up and play. Um, and so that's something reflecting on that time of my life. It's like, it's so much braver. And that's what I would say to kids today. It's so much braver to be able to use your words in those situations when you're hurt. Cause yeah, it's easy as an athlete to get up and play, even if you're really injured and you're going to get applauded for it. And you're going to, you know, people will raise you up for that, but you know, it's, it's really difficult to sit out and, and do the smart thing, sit on the sideline. Um, I wish I did it many times. Like I wish, you know, I took myself out of the game if my head was hurting, but you know, it kind of just goes back to that athlete mentality and that stigma. Um, and it, it took me, you know, years to learn that. Um, but I think the awareness, you know, the awareness of, um, of coaches, of parents, you know, and like concussion legacy foundation speaking up and, you know, we're headed in, in the right direction for sure. It's, it's a much better place than it was when I played. Um, but there's still like the stigma definitely still exists. Um, as you can see with, you know, with DJ on the call, her daughter, you know, everything I've heard about her, she's just tough as nails. Um, and, and we can all relate to that. So I think breaking, breaking that stigma, having people to talk to, having a community um, and, and coaches that, you know, want the best for you as a person is super important. Right. Thanks, Kelly. So, you know, DJ, as, as uh, you know, we're sort of here listening to these, uh, these star athletes sort of, you know, go through a retrospective review of, of, of all the things that they dealt with. And they had many friends and teammates um, uh, deal with and that are probably still dealing with in many, in many ways and sharing that and, and learning from that. How have you seen some of these aspects uh, in May and, and, and as, uh, as a mother uh, and as a family, how have, you, how have you been sort of tackling these scenarios and, and dealing with this and trying to identify, you know, things and, and what sort of resources and, and such have, have helped you, you know, along the way throughout, uh, throughout your process? Well, Kelly, thank you for sharing. I feel like Kelly is a grown version of May. I mean, when I hear her talk, I feel like I'm listening to May. It's unbelievable. And Quentin too. But, you know, I think like she said, that athlete mentality, what makes you such a good athlete is that you're willing to just grin and bear it and power through. And um, I think, you know, for children, I would say to parents is just be on high alert, you know, May went out and played again after her fourth concussion. She tried to hide it. And I knew something was up. Something was a little up. I could tell in her eyes and she got hit with the ball. And then it was after that one that she said, I think I have a concussion. Um, so I think as a parent, just to be on really high alert, there are certain things that, you know, there's, 
you know that they have a concussion and it's glossy eyes, um, irritable, withdrawn, angry. Um, you know, we, my husband and I kept telling ourselves, oh, well, maybe it's just because she's 15 now. Like she's just gotten really moody. I mean, we didn't know what was going on, but she was not herself. Um, so I think just trusting your instinct and, and if something does not seem right, you know, delve into it. And especially of a child who is this athletic nature because they don't like to show weakness. I mean, that to, for them to admit that they're not feeling good or that they're feeling depressed or anxious um, is weakness. And so again, I think that's why just breaking down the stigma of mental health is so huge because that sort of personality, you know, is not willing to divulge anything in that way. Um, so I think seeking, trusting your instincts, seeking help right away. And from what I know now, and I wish we had done things earlier, you know, in the olden days, and still there's doctors now that just say, go home and lie in a room and be in the dark, but there's actually so much more you can do. And I think being proactive, getting on a prescribed exercise regimen, sort of like Kelly had alluded to, which we just started, um, you know, fluid intake, hydration, um, you know, visual vestibular therapy right away, which I think has really helped May. The, the old school thought of sitting around and not doing anything actually makes it worse. So as a, as a parent, I would say just heavily use any resource. I think we may have uh, lost uh, DJ real quick. DJ, you're back. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we have you back. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I just think trust your instinct and, and advocate for your child. Um, I think as a parent, you know, if, if it, you know, if they're, if they're an adult, it's different, but as a parent, you really have to advocate for them and don't take, you know, oh, they just need to stay off screens for a while. That's not enough. There's a lot more that you can do. So through Concussion Legacy Foundation, you know, other parents are resources that Chris Nowinski got me in touch with um, of children who had similar issues as May. And, um, and then also Chris was able to get us in touch with doctors at Mayo Clinic that I learned about through his podcast um, who have now diagnosed our daughter with POTS, but also have given us, you know, prescriptual prescription medication and therapeutic interventions to help her on the road to recovery. Thank so. you, DJ. Oh, go ahead if you had something else. No, that's good. I know we could keep talking about this all night. Yeah. Um, but no, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing that. I'm, you know, without question, I know it's going to help a lot of the families um, that, uh, you know, that are, that, are, that are going through this right now that have loved ones, um, you know, in your, in your case that are young, that are, that are sort of dealing with it and going through it, you know, when Q and Kelly, you know, were, were, were going through it as well. Um, and I'm sure it's going to be extraordinarily helpful for those that are on this call. Um, Dr. Dockery, so as, as we're sort of discussing this and going through things, you know, from your perspective, oh, yeah. One more thing. Just to Absolutely. Dr. Dockery's point, only because I'm the only, I guess, parent raising four little athletes. My husband and I have talked about this a lot. I absolutely agree with you on um, really discussing and recognizing your children's talents outside of sports, you know, at a young age. My husband and I played sports and, you know, we did our thing, but now that we have a daughter who can't, you know, we realize that how important it is to develop the whole body, whether it's a musical talent or math, or there's more to life than sports. But I think it's so much a part of our culture um, that it's easy. And especially now with club sports and, you know, it's easy for parents to just get swept into that world. So that would be another piece of advice. I think that's incredible advice. I mean, because, you know, everyone has sort of touched upon that, you know, this evening um, when we're discussing these things. Um, 
is uh, is you know sort of the, your identity as you move forward, uh, you know, beyond sport, and then realizing that, as you pointed out, there is much more to life uh, than sport. But when you're in it as a young, you know, athlete, uh, it's sometimes very difficult to realize. Um, and I think you do need that support system, and you do need those uh, individuals in your life. Uh, to your point, uh, DJ, that are focusing in on and identifying those non-athletic wonderful traits of you um, and not just seeing you as that as that athlete. Um, so uh, Dr. Dockery, I'm sure you have a few things to, to add would love to, would love to, to hear as well as uh, some some useful resources that you think um, are out there for anyone that is a sort of uh, you know listening in tonight and, and taking this in and then uh, Q and Kelly, um, I would love to also get your uh, your sort of final thoughts and, and, and your message uh, to everybody on this uh, on this discussion tonight. Sure. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking, you know, I just, there's probably people listening, you know, I think we all look for information, right, when we're sort of hurting or confused or um, perhaps hopeless. And, you know, so there may be people looking for information about this or how to manage all of this. So I, I really hope that people are hearing that there is help, like there is life beyond a concussion, multiple concussions, post-concussion syndrome. Like there is absolutely, I mean, I work with guys who have, who are pretty cognitively impaired potentially from their football days and they are still able to live fulfilling and happy lives, right? Um, but I think we, we got to all as a community, we start like um, DJ, as you were saying, right, looking as, at the whole kid, and I'm also thinking about what Q is saying, like, let's also start giving our kids the language so that they can, when, when something happens, they know what's going on with them. They can name it. They can say, I feel sad, you know, or I feel, you know, and, and I think as parents who might be listening, like, you should expect, or if you yourself have struggled with concussion, you should expect some mental health related symptoms. It's such a tangled web, right? You know, if your concussion disrupts your sleep, sleep can disrupt your mood. You know, it's, it, it's just all tangled. So uh, we really should be talking about it. We should, really shouldn't feel any shame about this at all. Um, so the more we're talking about it, the more I, I think we can kind of reduce that. Because again, you know, there's folks who could be listening, feeling really alone. You know, actually, that's one of the worst parts of my job as a psychologist is that I get to like work one on one with people and I hear these stories and then the person leaves my office and the next person comes in and they say the exact same thing and I want to be like, you are so not alone, you know, but they feel so alone like they're the only one in the world that feels that and I'm like, you just pass someone in the hallway that feels just like you but you know I can't say that but but you know events like this can open that up and show that it's really normal and, and then the last thing i would add is um you know we should and we haven't used this word but we should honor that there is like a degree of grief when you transition out of sport right you were you were losing something um and to sort of you know i think about may and how she may be feeling right and that it's that that grieving process is normal and is okay. Uh, so I would, but I would urge anyone, I think Dr. Regan, you were talking about resources, like certainly, you know, reach out CLF, there's, you know, get help. Like if you're struggling with depression, anxiety, there's, you know, mental health resources, we can help you find those, um, but you can feel better as Kelly says, as Q says, like you, there's life beyond this and you really, you can and will feel better uh, if you just take a chance to, to kind of get that help. So I will pass it off to the rest of the panelists on that one. Thank you, Kira. Thank you, Dr. Dockery. Uh, very helpful. And, uh, and we'll, for everyone um, uh, on uh, right now, we'll have a, uh, a, a slide that will show at the end with some resources that we can go through. Um, if you want to take a screenshot or take some notes or something, just to sort of get prepared following uh, uh, Q and uh, and Kelly's uh, sort of final uh, comments and final message to everyone here tonight. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Um, as everyone's been talking, I have a few things on my mind. I think, um, you know, I know that um, Athlete Soul is is one of the partner organizations for this event, um, and we all are really passionate about athlete identity beyond sports. Um, I 
uh, co-created a program called Beyond Sports. And I think this is most applicable for athletes that um, are either still playing their sport or, you know, are, are transitioning soon. Um, but if you're looking to, you know, practice some of these techniques, right, like tapping into your emotions, understanding your identity, um, figuring out like what your purpose is beyond sport, um, that, that would definitely be a great resource. Um, I'll, you know, uh, <laughs> humble brag there. I, I think it's a great program and it's free for athletes. So if that's you, check it out um, through that, the Athletes Soul website. And I'll leave you with one quick tool that we use. Um, it's called the Triple Crown. And so, um, you know, DJ referenced this before, right? Like acknowledging your kids and people in your life, not just for what they do, but more of who they are and things like math, things like, you know, outside of just sports. But I, I take that a step further. I, I like to help athletes notice like how they would describe themselves in three words and use adjectives, don't use nouns. Don't say I'm a CEO or I'm an account manager or I'm a former athlete or, right? Like use descriptors. Um, for me, I can tell you what mine are. I am joyful, adventurous, and responsible. And when I live by those three things, that triple crown, that helps me live a life on purpose. It helps me go anywhere, including football and baseball, right? But it also helps me be, you know, a, a good friend, a good brother, um, a good son, um, a powerful leader, right? When I focus on those three things that have always been with me and that I've always been honing no matter what I do, that's when I find success really. So um, I just want to leave people with that idea of like a triple crown, like three words, you know, simplify it and focus on what you bring as value. Love that triple crown concept, Q. I uh, appreciate it. I think that could certainly be helpful for uh, for most people and yeah, everybody that is, that is listening to this. And only if people had, had heard it sooner, but um, but that's great. Thanks. Kelly, what are, your, what are your sort of final thoughts and message here? Yeah, thanks for everybody. I mean, I just, I feel like everybody has such wise words um, and, you know, it's applicable to my life right now. I feel, you know, I've said this before, um, but I feel like I'm still, you know, I'm, I'll never be on the other side completely because I'm always going to be, you know, looking and searching for answers. But from where I am right now, I can say um, I'm in a much better position than I was, um, you know, 10 years ago, even five years ago. Um, and my message would be that there 100% is more to life. Um, finding a community, I think, is huge. Uh, Athlete Soul, you know, he just talked about his um, project that he started. Um, you know, the Concussion Legacy Foundation. Um, I think finding ways to heal was a huge part of my journey. Um, I, I do wish I reached out to people sooner to figure, you know, to figure some things out. I tried to do a lot on my own and that was the athlete in me to try to figure it all out. And also just not come forward with my, you know, true emotions because I didn't have that in me at the time. Those tools like weren't there, um, but I've gotten better at that. And, you know, for, for me, it was finding, you know, a place to get glasses because that was a big part of my, you know, anxiety came along with that. And I was afraid to share that I had anxiety because my eyes weren't working together. And I, you know, got in touch with a, um, an ocular doctor who, who helped me find glasses. Um, you know, at Pittsburgh Medical Center, I was on medication for um, about two years on and off. And that really helped me. And the way that he described that was this will just help you help remind you of what normal is. And that really did help me. And I never saw medicine, you know, I, I took Zoloft um, and I never saw medicine in that way before. I was like, no, I'll, I'll never do that. But um, I'll, I'll, you know, that stigma is completely there too. And I, you know, I think if the doctor advises you that this is going to help you and rem reminds you of what normal is, um, I think that was really, really good advice for me um, and, and something I don't think a lot of people talk about or share because they're afraid of what other people will think. So, you know, I'm willing to share that about my story. Um, and also the whole mindfulness component of when I was ready to start thinking, you know, healthy thoughts. I think it's really, you know, important to, to find that one thing that, you know, I could do yoga because it was slow. And that's something that really helped me. Um, during my recovery was, was finding something to do, like pour, pour all my energy into. Um, and then just to go back to the thing that drives me in life is finding my purpose. And I've felt pretty purposeless, you know, the past few years, but I'm, I'm, I'm definitely figuring out a way to, you know, share my story with other people. And I think that, um, 
you know, I've heard this before. It's like, if my, if my story has, you know, helps one person, then it has meaning. And I really believe that <clears throat> we're all here to like, to share and help each other. Nobody's, nobody's going to get through this life alone. And um, it's really cool to even just have this community here of people that can kind of speak the same language and understand and, and empathize. Um, so, you know, find your community. It's a hundred percent out there and, you know, find, find what, you know, ways to help you in the moment heal and, and, and long-term and it'll be okay. Like <laughs> it's, it's, it's a long road, but um, for some people shorter than others, cause you know, they do tap into those resources. Uh, so, so that's, yeah, that's all I have to say. No, thank you, Kelly. Thank you for those final comments. I know it's going to help a lot of people, uh, you know, here on this uh, that are listening in tonight, um, especially, you know, given how personal uh, that uh, you and uh, Q and DJ uh, have, have, you know, always been with these discussions and, and Dr. Docky with her analysis. So panelists, I'll, I'll sort of stay on here um, uh, as we go through. Uh, Danielle, I think it's going to bring up a slide of some resources um, for everyone that is, uh, that is uh, on tonight. Uh, so as uh, Dr. Dockery um, alluded to, uh, you know, here are some resources, take a screenshot, um, however you want to save these, but the Concussion Legacy Foundation website is there. Um, the CLF helpline is there as well for those that are, that are struggling. Um, and then you can learn more about um, retirement from concussions uh, through Dr. Cantu, uh, one of the co-directors of um, the Concussion Legacy uh, Foundation. And so there's a nice YouTube of him. I believe it's about a, a minute and a half there. Uh, where he discusses uh, retirement uh, through concussions. Uh, and then the Athlete Soul, um, again, as we touch upon as one of the organizing um, um, groups for, for this evening, the website is there. Uh, the Beyond Soul program is a very valuable program um, with, the, uh, with the website there. Uh, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline that Dr. Dockery was, uh, was discussing um, is always obviously a resource that is available. It's not um, you know, through Concussion Legacy or Athlete Soul, but it's a very important uh, resource that is available for everyone. Um, so please be well aware of this. Um, take this down, take it down from somebody uh, that you think might benefit from this uh, as well. So this is why this slide is here um, to provide these resources. And then Tackle What's Next um, website here, and then the newsletter for Tackle What's Next. So again, I just want to thank all the panelists um, for joining tonight, for getting personal, uh, sharing your stories, um, and, uh, and really discussing uh, an incredibly important topic, uh, battling the stigma of, uh, of uh, retirement uh, from your athletic uh, life, um, the stigma of uh, living with concussions, moving on uh, from concussions and the, and the sense of community. So it's, thank you to, to Q. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Dr. Dockery and, and DJ. Very, very um, valuable um, and helpful and, uh, and wonderful that you were able to join us uh, tonight. And finally, thanks again to Tackle What's Next and Daniel Berman and your team for, for organizing. And of course, Athlete Soul and Concussion Legacy Foundation for everything that they have done and continue to do and, and will continue to do moving, moving into the future. So, and thank you for everyone for, uh, for joining us tonight and uh, allowing us to sort of have this discussion with you uh, on Wednesday. Uh, I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks everyone. That was amazing. Are we on mute?